should just get started. Uh, we have a very exciting talk today. We have John Alexander with us. Uh, he is the author of Citizens, Why the Key to Fixing Everything is All of Us, and co-founder of the New Citizenship Project, a book and company that works to shift the dominant story of the individual in society from consumer to citizen. Uh, we will be talking about pirates today, so stay tuned. And um, and I guess let's just get started. John, welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about you and maybe the epiphany you had that made you kind of decide to question and lead leave your illustrious career in advertising. If there is such a thing as an illustrious career, in <laughs> um, no. Thanks for having me. And the first thing I want to say is I'm I, I'm really kind of I was kind of keen to join this conversation to learn as much as anything. So I'm I am definitely not an expert in in the field of DAOs and decentralized organizations. I to a huge degree, certainly not in their current form. But I am a really I'm a really curious student of it, and and. I guess a bit more of a historian in some ways in this context, um, and and I'm very interested in how how our society changes and evolves, particularly in this moment in time. And so, so to answer your question, so my, my, as you say, my background is in the advertising industry originally. I sort of stumbled into that world out of university, having only ever really wanted to be a professional athlete before that, um, which is a whole other story. But uh, but very quick, very early on in advertising, began to ask myself uh, the a question that was really really sort of framed to me by my first boss, who said who said what you've got to remember is the average consumer sees something like three thousand commercial messages a day. And you've got to cut through that. You've got to make yours the best. And I, and I, for a while, I was happy in the sort of make mine the best. And then over time, began to think more and more about really what are we doing to ourselves and to our society and to what we believe is possible when when we're surrounded by that sort of intensity of 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 commercial messaging. And, and where I got to was this actually a bit of a, a kind of an epiphany moment for me of going actually this isn't this isn't just sort of a, a, an overwhelming flood of information this is a this is a story we're telling ourselves about who we are and what we're capable of and ultimately like long story short and, and the reason I ended up writing the book was because where I've got to is a is, is I think an offer of a way of seeing the moment in time we're living in through the lens of, of what I call th of three stories basically um, and I call the stories subject consumer and citizen and it's a it's a sort of broadly historical uh, a, a, a diagnosis that as we'll dig into in a bit more in a, in a moment but but the broad the broad sweep goes up until the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th we were something like subjects the, the story we lived in was what I call the subject story and that story in that story the right thing to do was to keep your head down do as you're told get what you're given on the basis that the god-given few who run society know best and they'll they'll tell us what to do to achieve the best outcomes for society as a whole uh, that that story kind of fell apart at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, um, and out of the two world wars, a different story was more or less deliberately, more or less consciously constructed, and that's what I call that the consumer story. Uh, and in the consumer story, the right thing to do is to pursue self-interest, to to look out look out for number one, to choose the option that suits you best from those that are offered, on the basis that individual self-interest will aggregate to collective interest. Um, and that's the sort of the market society, as you would. And what I believe is happening right now is that just as the subject story collapsed in on itself at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th, I think the consumer story is collapsing in on itself now. And 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 sort of when I came to that that realization, I was still working in the advertising industry, which, as you can imagine, wasn't much fun. Um, but but what I and but what I now work on and the idea I work with is that actually there's another story and arguably the deepest truth of humanity is what I call the citizen story, which and that in that story, the right thing to do is to get involved, to contribute your ideas, energy and resources to the pursuit of the best outcomes for society as a whole and to invite others to do so on the basis that actually all of us are smarter than any of us. And that that is how the best society will result. And I'm sure you can immediately like I, I talk about DAOs, like I say, I'm not an expert in this in this world and to anything like the degree that you all will be, but I do see DAOs as one manifestation of that of that story emerging, the kind of the the, the this this broad phenomenon. Um, 
and so yeah so so what i'm what the work i do in the world I, I run a little consulting business now that tries to use the sort of the skills of creative communication but to but to speak to people as citizens rather than just as consumers to to invite people into their agency and shaping the world not just to sell them stuff um and i guess maybe the last thing i'll say by way of broad framing is i think i think the the greatest danger in this time is that um too many of the institutions and sort of power centers in our society are are using their communications power to say shush little people just go shopping and trying to sort of tell everyone just to stay quiet and look out for their own and, and assuming self-interest on the part of people and actually what that all that is doing i think is is pushing people into the arms of a resurgent subject story of a of, because we know that these that, the, that these institutions aren't able to don't have the solutions to face the challenges of our times, the 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 uncertainty and the kind of chaos that results from that is being sort of suppressed and 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 into that in, and we know it's not working and then into that void the the the, the authoritarian voice comes through strong and offers a, a, a full simplicity but one that's very attractive in this time. So I hope that makes some sense of the kind of underlying ideas I'm working with by way of a bit of an opener. Yeah, that was a great uh, articulation, especially of the problem that we're seeing and maybe kind of uh, why this is an issue that we want to solve, right? And then you're touching on, you know, why why are you here talking to us? We're, we're building DAOs, and I think DAOs largely are kind of people building DAOs are seeing kind of these problems and wanting to build solutions for that into the, into the future. Um, and so one of the fascinating things about uh, when we talked earlier was this idea, is a DAO new? Um, yeah. Are these are these problems new? Have we tried to solve them before? Um, you know, and what does that look like? And, th and this this really is where the pirates came in, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll, I'll unpack the, the, the a little bit the, the story of the pirates that Sandy and I uh, uh, got very excited about together and then framed the session and attracted <laughs> You to it but um so so the short the, the sort of short answer is no in many ways i don't think DAOs are new in purpose and spirit i think uh because where i'm in the, in the work i do in this in the where i'm coming from my diagnosis that the un the, the underlying argument is that humans are citizens by nature we are collaborative creative caring creatures who want to get involved and shape the world we and when we are just sort of shushed, as I say in the in this consumer story, we or or told what to do when and denied agency. Actually, we end up wanting to seek agency and find a way to do it, and and it, particularly when power takes it to extremes and and shuts us down. And so, actually, the story in my, as I've come to see it, the story of human history is is, is in general the story of kind of uh, excesses of power and then and then these sort of self organizing. Uh, surges of energy trying to find a way to 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 redefine the world to to organize differently and and my favorite example of this is the golden age pirates and i and until i started the research for my book i was i was kind of a, I, I i had the had the sort of um what's his name the sort of uh, jack sparrow kind of pirates of the caribbean image in my, in my mind as i'm sure many of us do and but but actually when i dug into it um we, what I found is that pirates, the, the, the golden age pirates, the sort of second half of the 17th century, were some of the original, some of the most powerful sort of citizen organizing groups, self-organizing, uh, self-ruling communities that, 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 that the world's ever seen, actually. And, and, and the, to the extent where they have, they had sort of pirate codes and social insurance measures where, where there were set payouts if you lost an arm or a leg and, and they were bounded, there was a uh, bounded inequality. So the captain and the quartermaster would only earn a certain multiple of what every member of the crew would earn. And, and, uh, and, and there were countervailing powers. So captain versus quartermaster and all this kind of thing. And, and, and some, and these things were enshrined in kind of pirate codes in, in, in rules of those communities. Um, and it even got to the extent where, where there were, there was a whole kind of pirate, um, pirate community in Nassau uh, that, that was, that was on land and starting to really flourish. Uh, and, and what's so interesting about this, uh, is not just that, that that's what was happening, but, but what had come just before. Um, and very few people talk about this, um, 
the, the 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 fact like it's so interesting when you look back through history how how many how how little we sort of understand what what immediately preceded what and what the relationship between those things might be and what's so fascinating is that the the golden age pirates came immediately after the english civil war and 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 even more immediately after um what what's known as the putney debates and so, so to give you, if you're for those of you who aren't uh, aren't enshrined in your English uh, English history, um, basically what happened was that King uh, Charles the First, as King of England, was a an asshole, <laughs> um, and he he massively exceeded the reach of his powers, and uh, and a, a civil war broke out, uh, uh, the the army kind of turned against him, and 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 the commoners turned against him and and like I'm oversimplifying but essentially he was overthrown and there came this moment when Charles I was under house arrest at a, a Hampton Court Palace sort of a, a bit a bit west of London um, and the and just a few miles up the river the 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 army and the, the what were called the new model army but also a, a, a whole load of political thinkers called the levelers and the commoners and so on gathered in, in a church in, in Putney, just a few miles up river from where the king was being kept, and de essentially debated how you run a kingdom without a king. And it was in that space that the, in, in St Mary's Church in Putney, just down the road from where I used to live, where the principle of universal suffrage was first proposed. The idea that, that there's a the famous speech by a man called T Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, where he said that the poorest he that is on earth has as much a say as the greatest he that to, to, to have a say under the, on the government under which he is under which he lives. And if he hasn't had that say, then there's no reason for him to respect that government. And and and, and so and actually when you when you trace back the, the lineage, what you find, so like I say, long story short, and we I don't want to go too too deep into this, but but the 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 rebellion, the kind of the uprising was eventually overthrown and Charles II came back to the throne. Um, and and the the goal, many of the many of the um, the revolutionaries, the people who were proposing these ideas and debating these ideas, became the pirates, um, became the golden age pirates, and 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 started to live out and design these principles into the ways that they were living aboard ship, and 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 I think what's so fascinating then is to go so what happened. And, 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 and why do we see pirates in the way we do today? And essentially, like, these guys were dangerous, particularly when Nassau started to thrive. Um, these guys were dangerous to the, to the established order. They were dangerous to the kings. Uh, they were dangerous to the empires. And, they were, and, and so they weren't just crushed, but propaganda was used against them. They were, they were portrayed as uh, enemies of the state because they were a threat. And it's such an interesting thing that the power of the storytelling that 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 has that has sustained through through three and a half centuries to us and our preconceptions of who these guys were, and and just to be like I'm not gonna I, I don't want to oversimplify this like that there there were some there were some uh, th there was an interesting relationship between propaganda and reality because they were portrayed as as evil psychopaths who are, who are breaking up, they sort of leaned into that and, and started to behave in those ways sometimes. And, and really interestingly, Sam in this in this lovely book, Be More Pirate, which is the second book you should read, uh, Sam Conniff talks um, talks about how the, the, the Skull and Crossbones, the Jolly Roger was essentially the world's uh, sort of a very early branding exercise because what they, the, the, they, the pirates leaned into the idea that they were these dangerous psychopaths created this symbolism and and basically did it so that most of the time they wouldn't have to actually fight anyone because people were so scared that they just surrender <laughs> and there's this whole really fascinating thing of like that i think is relevant to the dao community now in in several ways like this idea of um that that through our history we've we, we've 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 reached these points where the where the organising of our society ceases to make sense, and we've tried, and we needed to step out of it and find other ways. And then I think an, a really interesting kind of cautionary tale of like of how you can be portrayed, and and what the dangers are to step into. Like some of the pirates were genuinely like really 
I, I, as far as I understand it, Henry Morgan and so on, were genuinely kind of really trying to figure out how to how to run a society differently. Some of them got really excited by the by the psychopath tendency and and started killing as many people as they could. And I think you can see that in in this kind of this wave of technology emerging. Some are, some get some are really trying to figure out as I my understanding is that the R and Dow community are trying to do trying to figure out how you do this stuff, how we can design for the future of governance. And some are just going, we can step outside this and, and shove a load of cash in our pockets. And so I think there's, yeah, I, I'll stop there with that answer, but I think there's some really interesting um, uh, meat to be found to chew on by by sort of, by thinking about where is, when have these moments come up elsewhere in our past and, and how might we learn from from what's happened in those times? Yeah, I just want to let that sink in a little bit, right? <laughs> um, so, so what's really interesting there is that kind of historical point of time where um, you know people really shifted and in, into the you know they were like living on their ships on the sea and away from government intervention um, and kind of building their own societies, and that that was really fascinating. And then another thing that we had talked about is kind of the more modern day examples of Taiwan and really how um, these societies and these, you know, uh, organizing groups can actually then make changes with the government. So not just kind of be sparked by by the evils of the uh, excesses of power, but also then how can you use these communities to then change things for the better, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I um, mean, uh... A couple of other stories, uh, very, one very brief and then one one at a slightly greater length. Another story I love is the founding of the nation of Iceland, which is essentially people fleeing uh, the, the extreme rule of King Harold in Norway in about 900 AD and, and move, shipping off to Iceland and, and, and they're creating a, a new way of running society. And actually the, the, it's called the, um, the Althing is the, is the oldest ex extant parliament in the world, uh, but established in, in 900 odd AD and, and still, still functioning on broadly the same basis today. Like there's, so, and, and so finding ways to, to really organize in such a way as can, can sustain a whole society has been something we have done in the past in reaction to excesses of power. My favorite, my, the, the example um, you just alluded to, Taiwan, and, and is my favorite story from research for the book I, uh, for the book I wrote, that is, and, is, and is, I think, um, again, really interesting to, to think about and learn from. I'll, I'll tell you the story in a little, just, briefly, but in a bit of detail. But so, so the story starts back in 2012 when um, uh, the, the government of Taiwan tried to um, basically launch what they called the economic power up plan. And this was a pure uh, example of shush little people just go shopping as messages. It was, they said things like, um, don't us waste time talking about policies. We'll we'll get on with growing the economy, and you get on with your lives. And it was that that was the sort of national story, and it seemed to go down okay. But a group of hackers started to organise. Some of you may know this story, and they called themselves Gov Zero because what they did was they built parallel websites to government websites, all with the URLs g 0 vtw And on these sites, what you could do was. Uh, they, they scraped a load of data, made it available, made budget lines available for comment and upvote and downvote. And, and they had conversation menus that people could download and use to discuss government business at home and this sort of thing. And it wasn't massive, but it started to grow. And then in 2014, the government tried to rush through a trade bill with mainland China under the banner of the economic power up plan. And at that point, a protest broke out uh, and the protesters occupied the Taiwanese parliament. Um, and the Gov Zero gang got a broadband connection in and streamed footage of what the protesters were doing all over the country. And what they were doing was using Gov Zero tools to debate the clauses of the trade bill. So they were they were doing what they would have said that the government should have been doing. At that point, the critical moment came because the, the the speaker of the parliament came under pressure to beat the protesters out. Uh, and the fascinating thing is that he didn't. But instead, everyone thought he was going to old guy, all of this stuff. But instead, he said, uh, this is what this space is for. This is what should be happening here. 
Um, and, and in that moment, the whole story of the relationship between citizen and state shifted dramatically. Within the speaker promised the protesters that the, pro, the, the bill would get, get due scrutiny, it got thrown out. Uh, within six months, there were municipal elections all over Taiwan and, and candidates were elected from all over the country who had stood by the protesters. To, uh, in response to that, one of the leaders of the hacker movement became a mentor to a government minister. Um, and then two years on, there was a presidential election and that person became a minister in their own right. So hacker to mentor to minister in four years. Um, and then four years on, when COVID hit, Taiwan had the world's most successful COVID response, which was essentially a massive crowdsourced response. They, they never went into lockdown. They talked about participatory self-surveillance and making all the data available to people. They, uh, they, they, they set up challenge prizes for people to create apps that would track face mask availability in cases and these kind of things. They even set up a phone line where any citizen could ring in with ideas for how the country's response could be better. And 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 my, my very quickly on that, my favourite one is um, there's a lovely little story of a, a six year old boy apparently rang up and said um, the, the boys in my class don't want to wear their face masks because they're pink and they think that they're girly. So you need to do something to make pink face masks cool. And I think you should work with the baseball team. And, and apparently three days later, they had the, half the Taiwanese baseball team, the little boy and the president on the national televised press conference in pink face masks, which is just like it's just such <laughs> amazingly like like someone wrote a story about how a DAO transformed the society, right? It's like, but the interesting thing in this though, and, and I think the, so I interviewed um, Audrey Tang, who's the Taiwanese digital minister, who is the, the hacker turned mentor turned minister. Um, and, and one of the ways she, she talks about um, the, the transformation of Taiwanese government was that GovZero never um, always took, two things, always took on the responsibility of trying to figure out how the state should work for everyone and never positioned itself in um, in direct antagonism to the state. And, 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 so all, and so what they wanted to do was leave the door open for the existing state to come into their space. Now, I, like, I'm not trying to, maybe that's a sort of a lovely story that you can can tell uh, looking back at the past through rose tinted glasses right and, and I'm not pretending but I do think it's interesting that thing of like how do you how do you do this work in a way that uh, that genuinely sort of tries to step into the responsibility that's 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 needed like how do we how do we really accept what does it look like to really radically accept that that our institutions can't deal with this and to have the um, the magnanimity or something to 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 actually design for a future where we know we're going to be needed like we 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 just know that these systems that the systems we have today aren't up to the task and it, and I'm not saying DAOs are the only answer to that I'm I'm quite heavily involved in citizens assemblies and participatory democracy and all these sorts of things but there is there just is a moment in time right now when when this stuff it, then when the challenges we face and are, are really the, the caused by the, the, the story from which our institutions evolved. And therefore, we're gonna need new kinds of institutions, we're gonna need new kinds of processes. So how do we do that work in a way that, that, that has the magnanimity to know that these, people are, that these people are gonna feel attacked by this, to know that they're, that they're gonna take it as, a, as an attack on them and as an affront, but, but try and do it in a way that, that is, that allows and creates the space for them to move into, and, I, and maybe I'm being, uh, I, th I'm, I'm, this is right at the edge of my thinking and learning, right? So I'm not, I'm not sort of saying stuff that I'm that I've got fully thought through. But I, when I look at the Dow movement and I look at R and Dow and I talk to Daniel and to you, Sandy, I'm like, I'm, I'm so excited and I'm kind of fearful as well, uh, both, both for the, for the. For the for the existing institutions and for you and where this might go um, and and those stories maybe express a little bit of why that is. What are you afraid of? Ha. Um, uh, I mean, the way I characterised it some the other day is like I think I think. Um, 
I think the moment we're in is one where the the people who are on the inside of the the institutions, the the, the structures of power, um, many of them are, are very well intentioned, and they and they and they're trying to figure out, but they just don't have the tools. In this moment, there's a load of us, and I'm like like I say, this community, the the cit- democracy next, the, the who are working on citizens assembly, all all sorts of different aspects of this who are kind of at the moment sort of knocking on the door uh, on, on on one side of the building if you if you think of these institutions as a kind of as a as a as a single building just for the sake of illustration and 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 on one side of that building one one door there's there's us uh, there's us in the broadest sense kind of and we've been we're sort of building little houses and trying to figure out how that works and then knocking on the door and saying can you come and look at what we're doing because i think you might find it useful but we're getting increasingly frustrated that they're not coming out and looking, right? <laughs> um, and at the same time, uh, on the other side of the building, there's a group of other people who are getting just as frustrated as us, if not much more so, for often very understandable reasons. Also because their problems aren't being solved by the people inside the building. Mm-hmm. Uh and they've got pitchforks and torches, and some of them are wearing like some of them are wearing hot helmets with bull's horns on, right? Like let's let's not <laughs> be about the bush. Like, we, we all know what we're talking about, right? But, but from inside the building, those two groups can look pretty similar. And and I and what I'm trying to wrestle with for my, what I'm thinking a lot about at the moment is how how do we get them how do we get those in those positions of power to understand that this is not an attack this isn't an attack on them this isn't the the QAnon like uh shaman or whatever he was called like this is this is these are authentic attempts to to try and figure out how this how the hell we're gonna we're gonna do life together on this planet um because that's what that's what we need to figure out and i and i don't i don't know the best way to do that uh, but i do I do, and and therefore I'm fearful because I think either they, I think I think the the great risk at the moment is that those on the inside of that building, even those with the best of intentions, are kind of shutting down, and the result is that those the guys with the pitchforks and the bull's horns are getting angrier and angrier, mm-hmm. and yeah, then it blows up. Yeah, that would be a really. Um... I think a good topic to kind of dive into, but, and also just thinking about the scale, right? Taiwan is kind of small compared to some other um, large global powers. And then how does that kind of play a role in uh, how much impact you can have from the outside in? Yeah. And really valid questions like, I mean, Taiwan's small. It's not that small. Some people, sometimes people think it's smaller than it is, right? It's 23 million people. It's, uh, and it's, so Australia's 26 million and loads of people and everyone was talking about Australia like Sweden's like 4 million or something and people were talking about Sweden's approach to the pandemic and and somehow we didn't we didn't we didn't think about Taiwan even though like there's this amazing thing they published a a, a, a list of 124 actions they'd taken in an English language journal uh, on May on March the 3rd 2020 which was three weeks before Britain even went into lockdown. Like, and, and so they're really, really trying hard to make available this stuff. And, and, and yes, but, but, you're, but yeah, Taiwan is not, um, it's a, it is an isolated example. I mean, I think, I, think, I think we see some of these things showing up in lots of different ways and places. But, um, and, and I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to offer in my work is a, is a language with it by by naming these things by naming subject consumer and citizen trying to name holes uh not 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 trying to sort of take ownership of them in any way but trying to name something so that we can distinguish between things and i think and i think that's some of where we are at the moment trying to understand like what is a what is a threat what is an evolution what's an experiment um and what's uh what's just aggression and and, and danger um so yeah i don't i don't know i think th- i think these things are 
And like the city of Paris now has a standing citizens assembly as part of its governance structure, which decides the theme for 100 million euros of participatory budgeting a year and, and, and is made up of randomly selected citizens holding the elected city council to account. Like there are, and Paris is not an, in, not a, not an insignificant city, either culturally or in terms of population size. Like some of these, some of these experiments are taking shape and scale. And, but, but we're in a but we're in a super dangerous moment. Um, yeah, I don't so know where what, people. Are <laughs> what's your? Uh, how do you envision the future of our of our? What's your your hope for the what's future? The dream? And and your and your theory of change for getting there. <laughs> yeah. Well, so um, my hope for the future is that we can. Is that we is that we can evolve the the institutions and structures of our society to into a, into what I call the citizen story that 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 we could take uh, Paris style Taiwan style approaches to the to to every institution. I uh, in the book I go on a couple of like thought experiments. Like I've done one of them is what what would it look like for us to crowdsource a renewal of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Like how might we run a process that would actually kind of do that using combinations of, of uh, I mean, Mexico City crowdsourced the constitution a few years back. Like then some of these processes have been experimented with and figured out. I'm, I'm working at the moment with um, uh, the people in this community might love, uh, a guy called Baratunde Thurston has a podcast called How to Citizen in the States, which is uh, really lovely using the word citizen as a verb and exploring all of these, um, all of these questions from all sorts of angles. So I, I don't have a kind of, um, I don't sort of have an have an have a vision for the future in the sense of an answer, but I definitely have a vision for the future in the sense of a question. Like, how can we redesign our institutions and structures around the idea of people as as citizens, as creative, collaborative creatures who need to be involved and will get angry if they are not involved, rather than around the idea of people as as sort of lazy, selfish individual uh, maximization agents. And then, and then, in terms of theory of change, I, um, I I think a lot about Taiwan and and that moment when the Speaker of the Parliament endorsed the protest, essentially. And and I've been trying to think about like my my best hypothesis at the moment is like a combination. Like I'm, I'm thinking about how does this moment of change happen? And I, and I guess the theory of change is if if you start from the basis that humans are citizens by nature then the theory of change isn't that we have to teach everyone to be citizens. The theory of change is that we are already citizens. What we have to do is get the, get the dominant story of society to shift, get the, get the institutions to speak to us as citizens rather than as consumers. Um, and, 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 in, and if that can happen, then the story can shift really dramatically, really quickly, just as it did in Taiwan, but on a mass scale. And so what are the ingredients for the kind of moment that a story might shift? And I think, in my mind, there are there are two critical kind of ingredients. The first is the you're going to need people in positions of power who can be open-minded enough to open the door. And so, how we work to to those in positions of power to actually see and understand the that this, as I say, is a polite knock on the door, not a not a pitchfork and a torch. Um, is one aspect of the work. Um, I'm work, doing some work at the moment with a really interesting organisation called the Apolitical Foundation, who who exists to train politicians all over the world. And, and I'd love to see them sort of engage with R and Dow. That could be a really interesting place for this to go. The second ingredient, I think, is the visibility of the store of the alternative, right? Like how how we make this and, and what. So in Taiwan, obviously the 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 the, the the, the 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 mindset of the insider in Taiwan was Speaker Wang, the Speaker of the Parliament, being open enough to invite the to to acknowledge the protesters. That's that's what we need more of on that side. In terms of making the story visible, the critical thing that the Gov Zero gang did was got that broadband connection in so that the story could get out, and and that moment of protest that that the whole nation was was watching. Then, then became a moment when everyone was watching protesters deliberating and discussing and forming ideas, 
And so how do we how do we design for moments when that can be visible? And so what, and this is so one of the I'm, I'm doing some work in the UK at the moment on what we're calling the people's plan for nature, trying to trying to use the fact that there's currently a David Attenborough uh, documentary about British nature on TV to, to sort of make something make something to, to, to say there's an energy around nature at the moment. So can we do a citizens assembly and a crowdsourcing and a whatever process? and try and get some visibility to that it hasn't 100 percent worked it's it's one experiment but but i guess all of that to say my my theory of change is about is about story and it's about moments when the story shifts rather than being about sort of uh long-term training i think we have to do the building on the outside and then we have to make visible what we're doing and and we have to cultivate the mindsets of those of, of the we have to we have to look for the people on the inside who are who are who are open and, and help them understand such that when those moments come they can step into it i love ultimately it's a kind of it's really the buckminster fuller um theory of change i don't know if pe people know the buckminster fuller quote but he's he, he has this famous quote he said you never change things by fighting the existing reality to change something create a new reality that makes the existing obsolete and it's which I think is very Dow, right? But it's like, how do we do that <laughs> and like truly step into the power of what we're doing? I love that Dow is an adjective. It's very Dow. <laughs> um, that's <laughs> fascinating. I, I love everything that you that you're saying right now. It's really terrific. Um, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions. At the risk of having a background noise, I'll pop in with one quick one. Um, I love for learning from history. I'd love to know more about where the pirate code came from. You're talking about crowdsourcing, and I think that's a real challenge that we're seeing. Um, was there one code? Were there variations on the code that you know you might go this way versus that? Where was it written down? How did it co get codified? So yeah, I think you'll you'll probably have to get into into Sam Conniff's work. I'll I'll post the link in the chat in a minute to 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 get into it in detail. <laughs> the the short answer though is that um uh the first code that we that we know of was um was the the articles of Henry Morgan and other buccaneers from from sixteen from the early sixteen seventies that was written up in a in a book called the Buccaneers of America, um. And and that had four four points to its to its constitution. This was essentially one of the first kind of written constitutions, you could argue. Um, it seems to have been written by Henry Morgan as captain of the ship, um, which is a bit of a shame for the story. <laughs> but <laughs> but the, the 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 throughout throughout the pirate era, there there were each. It seems that each uh, each ship had its own essentially had its own code or each collection of ships. So William Kidd had a had a different code. Um, uh, the articles of William Kidd became sort of spread around the, uh, in the around the world in 1696. Um, in, interestingly, actually, to your question, in the William Kidd one, um, it's uh, it's an agreement. Um, it's called the Articles of Agreement between Captain William Kidd and John Walker, quartermaster to the said ship's company. So in that in that instance, it's it's an it's sort of come from both of them. It, it's not I, I don't 100 percent know if they were sort of sourced uh, generated by the whole crew or they, they but who knows? Um, it, it might that might have happened. You might have to dig into the literature more than me. Um, but uh, I mean, I coming more up to date. I love the um, if you haven't seen the example of the Mexico City Constitution or the Icelandic Constitutional Convention that. Um, Ellen Landamore has written up in her book Open Democracy. I'll um, I'll stick a few links in the chat, but um, but there's a few few leads to start uh, start picking up on maybe. Awesome, thank you. I'll, I'll start picking links on the chat, but do 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 wade in with more questions and stuff as as I do if you like. Yeah, um, thanks, John. I'm thinking about the, let's say, the strategy to to knock on the door, uh, the yeah. door, and 
and I guess part of it would be finding the the governments, I guess, that are naturally most receptive to this. Like we have the El Salvador case uh, that adopted Bitcoin. And, uh, and, you know, Bitcoin comes with a whole bunch of baggage of Bitcoin maxis, who is his own very strange microculture, uh, very different from the Tao culture in, in many ways. <laughs> Um, so I don't know if that's perhaps the a low hanging fruit. Uh, we have now Japan, I think, is making quite a few advancements and so on. But in J I guess I'm thinking out loud, but hinting at would you have any sort of ideas as you have engaged a little bit more, well, closer to the policy side uh, of how one might think about knocking on that door? It's really interesting. I am. Um... I actually hadn't, I'd, I'd heard about the El Salvador thing, but I hadn't thought about it in this context. Um, I I think my, um, I don't know, I mean, maybe, you, you, so a couple of thoughts and then a question back to you. I think my my instinct is that the places where some some of the broader experimentation is going on, leaning into there and trying to make those relationships and say how could how could how could some sort of currency some sort of tokenization approach kind of add add weight to what you're already doing so um the 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 german speaking part of belgium the ostbelgian region was the first place anywhere in the world to to institute a standing citizens assembly as part of its governance structure um so what might it look like to go to that go to that region and and try and and say like how might we bring in bring in this kind of approach here into your governance as well like uh or paris i mean paris is maybe a, a next step on from that but it was the, the the people who designed who were invited to design the work in ostbelgian who were then invited again it was the same people behind the paris model so there's something about like getting into the places where which are open to the innovation and, and trying to expand it like framing this as governance innovation uh and and trying to ally it with some of the other governance innovations that are going on i think is interesting um and then i think i mean like like i say i'm doing this work with a political foundation i think sort of trying to find those people who are um who have started from have probably started from a position of of being inside the the institutional structures but but are are actively trying to kind of if you think about it as sort of as there's there's a sort of there's a there's a there's a realm of the possible let's say the realm of the possible is over here and the inside is here like the question is how do we bring those closer together or, or how do we sort of send envoys into from one direction to the other and I think I think a political foundation I think is sorry I keep figuring out what which hand I'm using but a political foundation is sort of the they're trying to stretch the boundaries of the inside. So how might we as those working a bit more from the outside try and try and sort of equip them for those arguments? Um, but but maybe know that we're not actually anticipating them back to this thing of moments know that we're not actually anticipating them knowing exactly what to do with that or or anticipating them contracting a project or whatever but but knowing that if they know about it if they understand it they can help others understand it and then when these critical moments come and you know when that when a when a, i mean sorry my brain's racing ahead of me because the, the what i was then thinking is some of these moments are going to be the result of crises right like we are we just are going to hit more catastrophe more crisis in the coming years like this summer is likely to be uh, uh, likely to have a whole load of extreme heat climatic events in different parts of the world how do we how do we make something ready for that moment that can just be adopted because that that was what happened in taiwan you could argue that they they built gov zero the whole gov zero kind of structure to be ready for when there was a crisis knowing that knowing that that would break down and that would come so i think i think there's a couple of different strategies there that, that maybe we have to pursue all, all of at once like how do we find the places where we might be able to weave in how do we find the people who are trying to stretch the story and and see if we can equip from within and equip them how do we prepare for the moments of collapse uh, and and make something sort of ready to pull off the shelf when that happens um 
I mean, I, I'm really one of the things I looked at in the research for the book was um, was the whole was Miami Tech Week and and how that came about with um, the mayor of Miami sort of saying, "Yeah, Silicon Valley, come on over, take take us over. You're you're welcome." How how did that moment happen, and what might a much more constructive version of that look like? Well, what's the what could be what could be develop that, 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 that then could demand an invite into a place. Um, I don't know. I don't know if any of that makes but, sense, but. The how can I help moment. That's what we call it. Yeah, in Miami. exactly. <laughs> he, he just literally replied to a tweet saying, yeah, uh, how can we... yeah it was it a was tweet weird. that said, how can we get San Francisco to, to move to Miami? And then the mayor replied back, how can I help? And that was it. It became t-shirts and. <laughs> It's crazy, yeah. right? Kind of launched like, a whole migration. Um, I'm curious, you know, this idea of us being citizens uh, kind of by nature. Yeah. And I agree with that, but I think that we've been so conditioned out of citizenship behavior. And so like what kind of tools I think that we need to cultivate in ourselves to be better citizens, you know, because citizen with, being a citizen comes be, being responsible, right? And feeling responsible for each other, not just survival mode for ourselves, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think, so in a way I, I think about it less in terms, I mean, there are skills, there's the skills of like uh, emotional skills and, and relationship skills and power skills and all, all kinds of stuff. And I'm also, like I, like I say, I think I think we have all of them in us, like intrinsically that they are, and and in many ways I think like a lot of the a lot of the training work is more about. Um, I, have a, I have a friend who talks about who said, has this lovely phrase: says, "Citizenship is a muscle you build, not a cup you empty," um, which I really like. Mm -hmm. It's like, and and that that muscle has atrophied dramatically um, because we've been essentially told not to use it. Um, but 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 when you start, you start. He, he's very funny, he, he, and he he sort of, sort of says, when you start to use the muscle, you start to like the look of yourself in the mirror, and then you want to use it some more. <laughs> and it's like it's just exactly. And and so there's something, but there's something in that. It's like, and, and but also when you the other thing that he says is like when you realise you've already got it. Then you then you start. That's when you really start to go. And one of the things that this the, the conversations I'm having with Baratunde, um, who runs the How to Citizen podcast, which I'll pop in the chat, are about like how do we how do we acknowledge that actually this is already going on? Like there uh, there are places in all over the world. Like and and in COVID there was that there was mutual aid groups sprang up everywhere. Right like. This this is it just it happens and and there's a lovely book by Rebecca Solnit called A Paradise Built in Hell where she goes back through the human response to catastrophe through history and finds that universally what happens is actually that people lean in and find one another and help mm -hmm. one another when so that it's not that we have this sort of veneer of civilization that that if peeled away kind of then we all kind of eat one another it's actually the opposite it's like the the veneer of of, of of civilization is actually what's making us be shit to each other, and and in the moments when it peels off, like we find one another and help. I'll check it. I'll check a couple more links in the chat. I'd like to offer that as an alternative to a codified agreement. Uh, there are instances still surviving uh, in a criminal underclass of basically traditions that go back well over a hundred years. It's been not surprisingly relegated to towards the outskirts of the larger societies. And uh, they are not at all based on written, uh, you know, codes. And instead they have a system of, uh, elders uh some you know assigned regionally uh, where they basically go by the tradition to determine what's in and what's out to basically 
you know, there are like some very core principles of not affiliating with the authority and uh, not hurting the civilians, they call them, and so on. And some of these forms, uh, when they, in, in more less of a criminal and more of kind of like these guerrilla kind of semi-autonomous groupings, they take more of a tribal um, approach. Um, and some of the traditions are really fascinating, like in both of those types, the leader is not allowed to marry uh, so as not to, because the leader's uh, only allegiance is to the tribe, is to the clan. And so, you know, they can have a living lady and, uh, you know, it's, of course, very patriarchal. But, I mean, these are armed guys shooting each other, right? I don't know that women want to participate in that form of governance. You know, it's like the life expectancy isn't great. <laughs> One of the core codes is that the families and the kids are out of the crossfire. It's like that's a given that all the beef is between the, you know, soldiers of relevant groupings and the civilians and the families are out. So so it's interesting that, and so those apparently go back a long time. I think that's right. I think, um, I mean, I guess I'm, I think we will always form rules to live by. My worry is that those sorts of, those sorts of rules that you're talking about, I think that I think you're talking about tend to occur in in the in the in once chaos has already arrived and, and it's sort of no, small... actually if you look at Cicero's speeches explicitly building by then on 500 years of Roman tradition uh it's very much rooted in antiquity but and then no, no, I, no, don't get me wrong I'm just saying like some of what you're saying about the in the criminal like the rules of like look leave the family out of it etc some of those are actually what come in when you end up at a such a fragmented scale they're the sort of the 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 rules of honor that that come to exist in in the favelas or in the or in the shant like that's that's sort of a bit not what I'm I am however really interested in the, the in what can in how these codes emerge and how they're carried and the role of elders and so on that you're talking about I, and I think there's there's a couple of different things there I, one of the people who I've been talking to a bit recently and and find really fascinating is, and I've posted his book in the chat as well this guy called Tyson Junker Porter who's an aboriginal philosopher who's and and so the subtitle of his book sand talk is how indigenous thinking can save the world and he he talks extensively in that about how um there are sort of levels of wisdom and and truth and and holding of truth that that you can that you need to work your way through that you're not just able to share at, at no at no warning and and how these become the codes by which a society runs so i think I think you're, you're you're definitely right to call out this stuff isn't always about sort of codifying and writing a constitution. I think there's something. I think from where we are now, I find that I'm I'm pretty excited about the idea of. Also, uh, in terms of scaling, that, if you look at the native traditions where clans would combine into tribes and tribes would combine into nations, they could do it without sort of centralizing the authority that you know in the nation each tribe was its own separate thing and there was no assumption that and that was you know all, also under Genghis Khan where tribes re very much retained their identity they they would combine in the military campaigns but then go back home with the loot and leave lead their separate lives Hey, hey, Walter. Uh, yes. I yeah. want to, I, I know that like a minute left. I think yeah, yeah. what I'm hearing in Walter and I, Walter's question and I'm thinking of too, is that one of the big challenges in this space is scale. Yeah. Um, the, 
I mean, you guys are talking about the awesome, like the citizens engagement, but the stories that we're telling are talking are, oh, they're big countries like 23 million. And I'm sitting here in a country of 300 million. And <laughs> part of what's part of being a, being a citizen is I cannot actually have an impact at that scale. You know, you can, we can tell ourselves stories, but it really is very hard. The, so there's something about small. And I think that's one of the things that we're learning in DAOs is how do we make that work in small? Um, and then I don't know if I'm going to ask you to answer because I'm even out of time. I'm super curious about how you see this um, relating to the um, Balaji Sunivasan's work on the network state and um, the the um, uh, Charter Cities Institute and things like that. So this is like a very different space, but talking about similar ideas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the very short version is I, I find those things kind of frightening because I think they're, I think they're, I, I read them and read them as being rooted, as I say, in more like the kind of Miami Tech Week philosophy of like, how do we get away from the burdensome arm of the state and how do the, how do the sovereign individuals kind of come together to find their own places without needing the little people, um, which is kind of why I guess I'm, I'm interested in how do we, like how do we actually design in such a way that we're designing for a whole society and for for all of the different genius that can come from everyone and how, so how do we do the sort of work that Balaji and the guys are doing but do it from a from a mentality that that believes that that that, that starts from the idea that that everyone has a has something to contribute and that the role of the governance design is to make it possible for everyone to make their contribution rather than mm -hmm rather than there's some sort of is it the other i know i keep mentioning books and stuff but i'm, I'm i've been reading uh octavia butler uh, a lot recently and her her patness series and the, the distinction she makes between that it's a whole exploration of the idea of the kind of the intrinsic and the instrumental which i think is is a distinction here i feel like balaji and those guys in the charter cities have some sort of instrumental view that that it's all for the sake of I don't know what actually, but some sort of achievement rather than rather than for the sake of a society which draws on and explores the kind of the 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 vitality of every of every human being. And I think there's something possible in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want you want I the same thing with a different brand. Sorry? You, have, you want something like a similar instrument with a different brand, a different mindset and a different goal than you have yeah. what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think it's a great way that stuff is is exit versus voice right yeah that's a great way to end this talk um so i just want to thank everybody for for joining us today thank you so much john um, fascinating i can talk for hours with you about this um so really appreciate you being here